Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming. My name is Solo and we're back for set 12 of things you didn't know in Elden Ring. These are of course the little details, all the big ones, strange interaction, bugs, or unexpected things. Some of these are useful tips, some of them are just nice to see. This series completely survives based on the comments of the previous video because there's so much to see and find in this game and I'm still learning tons when I do this series. Without any further ado though, let's begin the video. To begin the video then, we stand here in the red zone or I guess the lake of rot. Let's talk about this skill right here, Quick Step. You see, in 1.06, there was some changes made to both Quick Step and also Bloodhound Step. Now, the world rejoices at Bloodhound Step being nerfed. It's a bit of a shame about Quick Step, which was a weaker version and lesser used anyway, to also see nerfs. So it may have been a bit overlooked because Bloodhound Step was just such a menace in the community and finally it's been addressed, whereas Quick Step wasn't really talked about. So while Quick Step may have been a bit overlooked, it actually had three aspects of it changed. So yes, we've had it nerfed when used continuously when you're absolutely spamming it it's just not as effective but the actual time at which you can spam this ability out and just continuously use it well that's actually been improved it has a shortened activation interval when using it in succession as it says in the patch notes the idea is to allow you to circle around an enemy and kind of maintain your focus on the target you're evading which is a good thing another detail though that's quite important is the fact that it has greater movement when you're using light load like I am. So from this rock, say, here, let's see if I can get to this rock ahead of me. Let's see how far I go. So from about the middle, I just barely touched the rock. And now in my gorgeous heavy load form, let's see how far I actually go. So we're going to see if we can get close to that rock. And we are about a step behind or thereabout. Yeah, so it's definitely further, but it is a minor amount. Maybe half of a meter if we're, we're being kind. So in an area of knee-high swamp or whatever, and you want to use this to cross the area, it's actually a good idea to use quick step in light load as a better option now. Because it's cheaper on the FP, because if you're using it in light load, you've got the better travel distance, it's going to be more effective at getting you across, it, across areas like this. And as a bonus tip, I just gained Scarlet Rot by standing inside of the rot, and it just burned me. As you can see, it's absolutely chunking away at my health, dealing a lot of damage that I've got to heal through. But then you can use something that's quite well known to your advantage instead. So when you run into some rot like this and then roll around, what's going to happen is you're going to get covered in it. There we go, let me get properly covered. You see I'm all red now, and it's still building up. Now, the difference here is, yeah, I can use soap to remove it, or I can let it tick over and actually happen. For some reason, when this status applies, when from being covered in it rather than directly standing in it, you can see that it's doing about half the damage that I was taking when I had it activate just by running fully in it with skin touching it, I suppose. I guess the idea is my clothes are burning, not my skin, so it still hurts, but less. And that makes sense. But you can use this to your advantage by intentionally having it tick in that way, so you're taking less damage damage uh, throughout your crossings in poison swamps or otherwise. The next one comes from the comments in the videos from Josh Stone, who lets us know about this Ash of War, Prayerful Strike. Basically how this works is you use it, do a slam, and then you get some health back, and I'll show that in a second. It has a strange interaction though with some gadgets or tools that some of the enemies use. All right, now I've taken some damage. Let's do Prayerful Strike. And as you can see, it gives me a really reasonable amount of health, like 30% of my health back on a single hit. That's really good healing. But for some reason against certain tools and gadgets, like I said, this will also work, such as these flamethrower turrets that you can find around the world, in this case in Stormvale Castle. They seem to be an actual enemy of a type. As you can see, I can hit it and then I get the massive healing by attacking this thing. It's very strange. I guess the interaction must be that it's technically an enemy of some sort, and so that Ash of War is acknowledging it as an enemy that I'm striking with Prayerful Strike, and that's giving me that massive healing. Okay, our next detail is a really interesting one. I've come back to New Game Plus to be able to do it, and I'm in a specific place for that reason. It's to do with the Wing of Estelle, which, as we know, is a weapon that is part of the creatures, the beings of Void. This is an incredible sword, one of the best intelligence melee weapons in the game. Josh thinks it's the literal best, and I'm inclined to agree with him. Thanks to its incredible Ash of War or super unique heavy attack where you're able to send out multiple waves of blue that does really good damage at range and it costs no mana. But what we're actually interested in is the sound effect. Take a listen to it now. That's the sound effect that it's supposed to make. It's a sort of voidy sound that makes sense for this strange attack that it's doing. But there's a place where the sound completely changes. 
which is why I was in this location, in the Yilo Annex Tunnel at the west side of the inner consecrated snowfield. We are actually before a special boss. We're before one of the Estelle bosses. And in this location, anywhere in this mine, this happens to the sound effect of the heavy attack of the Wing of Estelle. Yes, it sounds like a strike of lightning that occurs every time I press R2. Whether I hold it, and then you hear it's on the initial trigger, or whether I spam the attack and do a quick version of the heavy attack. Yes, yeah, so for some reason the sound is completely broken or strange here against what would be itself, I guess. This is the Wing of Estelle, right? It comes from one of these beasts. I'm in an area where we're very near an active one of them, so maybe there's an issue with the, the coding here. People say that this might be caused by the fact that you're next to the boss, and so it does an attack that uses this kind of animation. And so it's playing the same sound effect as if you're using that boss attack, which is kind of weird, but also kind of cool. And there's nowhere else this is going to happen in the entire game. So yeah, it definitely deserves to be in this series. It's kind of a weird one. Now, one thing that maybe I thought was more commonly known than actually is, is something that keeps coming up in the comments recently. Now, most recently I saw it from Gra Metal in the comments, and it's to do with the secret entrance to the Deep Root Depths. This very important area will lead you to some seriously important lore details and optional content. I think the normal way to get there is through the aqueduct here in the underground area of the Siofa River. And by progressing to the Great Waterfall Basin, you get in a coffin and it kind of brings you to this area at the very beginning of it. However, as you can see, I'm standing over it at the Frenzied Flame Prescription Grace, which is before the special door that leads you to the Three Fingers and that potential ending, also known or referred to as many in the community as the Pizza Door. Instead of heading that way though, we take the Grace and put it behind us and cross over to this side and where this conveniently placed message is, is a wall that is cobbled in a kind of suspicious way. If we roll into it, that'll reveal the secret. And then we have a chest that has a rune arc inside of it. Just grab that. And then we can roll into this next wall. And hey, actually, we're exactly where we just talked about. There's a grace up here that you can't really get to in any easy way beyond that. This is the root-facing cliffs grace. And we're at the sort of eastern side near the Great Waterfall Crest where we begin otherwise. From here, we can make our way steadily down and get to this area at this point in the game. So it's a secret way to get to a secret area that I thought was more commonly known, but it does deserve to be in this series just in case it actually isn't. Now in this series, I've a couple times highlighted really cool spots where you can see unexpected things, like certain spots where you can see the Hallig Tree well before you're in that area. AKA Irma actually brings up a really good point that there is one tower where we can see most of the game, most of the map, all of the important areas bar like two. That is here in this tower. This is the Divine Tower of Limgrave. This is Godric's Tower. Once we're up here, we have an incredible view of nigh on the entire game, which is really, really cool. Looking eastward, we can of course see Kaelid, which is looking a bit snowy down there, strangely, without all the textures. And then we can see that we have the bestial sanctum over there. We have the two towers, the hidden one in the water, which allows us to actually see Far and Missoula, as we've said in this series. Over here, we have the Erd tree, obviously. From here, we can actually see the whole of the mountaintops of the giants and obviously the, the pot itself. Up there, we have a hilariously untextured Altus Pateau and its city. And there's its tower just to the left. And there's the other tower on the right. I believe that is the arena. Yes, that should be the arena. It's like half off the, facing the cliff. It's just completely untextured at this distance, so it looks a bit weird. As a comparison, we can see Kaelid's arena down there, which is still, yeah, less textured, but clearly more detailed at this kind of distance compared to uh, Limgrave, oh, sorry, Lindell's arena there that's just a blob. Over there, we can see the area of everyone's favorite Rikard and the volcano manor contained within. We have the Tower of Leonia, the lakes. We can also see the academy 
Academy right there, which looks small from over here. Fairly textured compared to the other things. Beyond that, we can even see the three towers there where Rani resides with her faction. Of course, from up top here, we can see the bridge that leads out to the tower we got here. There's the third arena, that one, of course, being Limgraves. And here's the Stormvale Castle, the keep itself. And up there, there's the massive plateau at the south side of the lakes, which we'll talk about in just a second. Facing south, we can, of course, see all of Limgrave, such as the floating rocks, the debris that forms the crater. And we can see all the way down to Morn Castle at the bottom of the Whaling Peninsula. So yes, from here, you can see the majority of the entire game. What we can't quite see is Faramazula because it's just not rendered in, as well as on the other side of the mountaintops of the Giants, uh, the Halig Tree. So it's a really cool spot to get a look at the nearly the damn game, the whole thing, except for the underground places. It'd be nice if they were a bit more textured, but it's still cool we can see so much from up here. So one detail that I really like is the fact that we can see the moon from the sky box, obviously. There it is and there it's gone! <laughs> <laughs> it's quite weird, the skybox of Elden Ring. Uh, I'm glad we could see that, actually. There's so many moments where the weather changes and you can't quite see as far, or little details are obscured, or like the moon just disappears before our eyes. However, if we come up to the cathedral here, which is on that, that plateau we just talked about at the southwestern point of the lakes, we're in a special location where we're really high up, and this is all to do with Rani and her moon faction. And as you can see, things are a little bit different up here. We have this glorious, blindingly bright moon staring down at us as well as these pillars of blue that take up the skybox. If you don't take the time to look up from this location, you might not realize this is the only place this actually happens. To be fair, you might be fighting a dragon, a little bit distracted to look up, but it is a really beautiful skybox and a really nice area, of course, tying to that secret ending or potentially true ending of Elden Ring with Rani and becoming her consort. It's a really cool detail though. It's cool that they make use of the skybox in this way in certain areas. Let me know if you know of any other places where they do things like this. But there you have it, my short and sweet set 12 of things you didn't know in Elden Ring. I'm particularly fond of the weird bugs like the Wing of Estelle sound effect. I like the really nice viewing things where you can see all the world from the one tower or that really cool moon view on the plateau. If you know any interesting details like that, then let me know in the comments. But in general, if you know something that's not widely known or strange finds, then drop it in the comments and we might include it in the next one. As always, a huge thank you for getting involved in the series and finding out these secrets and sharing them. Somehow there's still a lot to be found, it would seem. But now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye